Power is pretty important. In fact, it's, it's pretty much essential. As video creators, Mary and I realize this on a daily basis. Uh, we, every day, we, we pick up our camera and capture clips of the ups and downs of everyday life. The videos we create are a compilation of video clips taken throughout our day. It's mostly simply telling our story from one activity to another. And, and so given the nature of our industry, uh, power is important. Uh, we, you can always expect us to find our, a camera in our pocket or in our purse ready to pick it up and record. And most of what we record is mundane, it's routine. Uh, the treatments and therapies that accompany life with cystic fibrosis, the recipes and reviews of what's for dinner, uh, or the thoughts and musings of whatever's on our mind that day. But every once in a while, we have something uh, more epic to record. Uh, and whether it's a trip to the hospital, or, a, or a, a day visiting with family or friends, or, or maybe it's a night out shopping, and, and, and we, we're always sure to grab the camera before we go. We stick it in our pocket or in our purse, and I, I, I'm telling you that, that more than once a week, we get to our destination, we pull out the camera to record this moment that, you know, it's pretty important for us to get on camera, and we get that dreaded message, change the battery. <laughs> My heart sinks. We had everything we needed to capture the moment. I got the camera. I got the memory card. I cleared off the memory card. Charged the battery. The power is pretty important. In fact, it's essential. You would think that after 803 days of making a video every day, that Mary and I would get into a routine of charging the battery every night. But I still get that message, charge the battery. The power is pretty important. It's essential. And it's not just true of the life of video creators. It's, it's true in the lives of Jesus followers. Just as a camera without power cannot capture the shot that it was meant to record. Just as a car without an engine can't drive the miles it was meant to go. A Christian without the power of God cannot live the life it was meant to live. A 19th century preacher, uh, Charles Spurgeon, a preacher who I look up to greatly, puts it this way. Without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are ships without the wind. We are branches without sap. And like coals without fire, we are useless. It's not surprising then, as we turn to the book of Ephesians this morning, that in chapter 3, we, we, we turn to a climax of the letter, where Paul falls on his knees to pray for the church in Ephesus. And what does he pray for? He prays for power. He prays for the power of God to be at work in our lives. So the question I have for us this morning is, if the power of God is so important to the Christian life, where do we get it? And what does it do? So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, the passage we read moments ago, verses uh, 14 through 21. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Uh, we continue this morning in our series through the book of Ephesians as we've been walking through Paul's letter as he expounds to, to the church in Ephesus that there is immeasurably more of the Christian life. There's immeasurably more of, of life to be found in Jesus. There's a measure, measurably more for the church to experience and to live in. And, and 
As we look here at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, we, it starts with the words, for this reason. He's building on what came before, but if you'll remember from the beginning of Ephesians chapter 3, he began with these same words. For this reason, he says, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of the Gentiles, and then we had that dash. And last week we, we looked at this parentheses uh, the, the, where Paul, he's probably dictating the letter to a scribe who's writing it down. And, and, and he tells the scribe, okay, okay, write this. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of the Gentiles. He says, wait, 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 I, I need to explain something here. And we explored the mystery of the gospel. And, and so Paul finishes that 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 per parenthetical uh, little section here in Ephesians chapter 3. And so he's connecting for this reason to what came before Ephesians chapter 3, and, and specifically verse 2, where he talked about how in Christ Jesus, walls of hostility are broken down, and all are welcome at the cross of Jesus. The, the, he says, you who were once far off are now brought near through the cross of Christ. Peace with God is made possible. And he's building on the whole argument of Ephesians itself. That, that we are chosen by the Father. We're redeemed by the Son. We're sealed by the Spirit. That he raised us with Christ. That he seated us with Christ in the heavenly realms. And then he created us to do good works. To be his workmanship in the world. And, and, and now we, we, he's created this categorically new thing. This new humanity. He's called it the church. And here in the church, God, by his spirit, we saw in Ephesians chapter 2, he says, the spirit of God has chosen to dwell here in the church. So for this reason, we have the climax of Ephesians. Everything up to this point is building to this moment where Paul says, I fall on my knees before the Father. We are, are given the opportunity to eavesdrop on Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus. How did you learn how to pray? You, you probably learned by imitation. You, you learned, you heard a parent or a pastor, a peer. You heard them pray. And that, that's often how we learn how to pray. We learn to imitate how to pray. And, and it, it's by default how we learn to pray. It's, it's a neutral, neutral thing that that's how we learn how to pray. But it, the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he gave us a model, and we, we imitate that. And so we would do well this morning... If we look here at Ephesians chapter 3, verses uh, uh, 14 to 21, this prayer of the Apostle Paul, we would do well to imitate this prayer in our own lives, in our own prayers. And so what does Paul pray for? He prays for power. I can't remember the last time I prayed for power. He prays for power, the power of God to be at work in the lives of Christians. If you'll remember, though, this isn't the first time that Paul prays for power in Ephesians. If you remember in chapter 1, Paul prayed for that we would know resurrection power. At the end of Ephesians chapter 1, we have this prayer that, that we would uh, know, and not just mentally know, but, but experientially know that, that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is at work in our lives. That God doesn't make good people better, he makes dead people live. And this is, this is the reality. And I'll be honest, I, I went back and, and I watched that sermon that I preached on resurrection power, and I'll be honest, I got really excited about it. And I got really passionate about resurrection power. And, and I'm, I'm not ashamed to say this morning that I'm excited about resurrection power. Because if we really grasp that, that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is at work in our lives, 
Maybe we should take seriously this prayer here in Ephesians chapter 3 where Paul prays for power. Uh, Power is pretty important. In fact, it's essential. And so the first thing Paul prays for is that we would experience, that we would have power to experience immeasurably more of Christ's presence. Look what he says here at the beginning of verse 14. For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that, verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. The first thing Paul prays for is that we would have power to experience immeasurably more of Christ's presence in our lives. Look at how he says it. He says, I pray that you would, have, that you would be strengthened with power that, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, if, you, if you're like me and you read those words, you say, wait a second. I thought Christ already dwelled in our hearts. It's clear that Paul is writing to Christians here in, in, in Ephesians. He, he started the chapter saying, you are chosen by the Father. You're redeemed by the Son. You're sealed by the Spirit. And when he talked about being sealed by the Spirit, he says, the Spirit dwells within us. We are indwelt, we're given the, the Spirit as a guarantee, a deposit. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14. It, it, it's a deposit. And so if, if God in the Christian life, if the moment we put our faith in Jesus is the moment that, that, that Jesus, through his Spirit, indwells us, why does Paul pray for power for that to happen? I'm glad you asked. The word here that is used for dwell. It's it's the picture of inhabiting, of taking up residence. It's the picture of when you move into a new home, say it's a fixer-upper, and and, and you've got projects to do, and, and you move in, and the wall colors are just not your colors. There's wallpaper in the bathroom that looks just outdated, and it's just not you. And you move in and you slowly start working on projects around the house and you start painting the walls, you tear down the wallpaper. You start putting up some of your pictures and, and your touch here and there. This is the picture of dwelling, of taking up a residence. And so when Paul prays for power that we would experience immeasurably more of Jesus' presence in our lives, he's not saying that, that, that we need Jesus to come and, and be, dwell within us for the first time. He's saying, Jesus dwells within you. It's time for him to start putting his touches on your life. There's some projects in your life that Jesus wants to take care of. Paul prays that we would have power for this to happen. Because you and I both know that there are things in our lives that don't match up to our position in Christ. We learned that we are raised from the dead, we are seated with Jesus through faith in him, that when when God looks at us, he sees Jesus' righteousness. And there are things in our lives that don't match up to that. And Jesus says, I, I, I dwell within you, but I, I, I'm, I'm ready to move out of the guest bedroom and I'm ready to have the master. I'm ready to put my touches on your life. I'm ready for the, the way you talk about your, your family members, your coworkers. I'm ready for that to look a little more like me and a little less like you. I'm ready for your patience on the interstate to start looking more like me and less like you. There's some wallpaper that needs to come down. 
And there are things in our lives that we do not have the power to change. But God does. There are changes, there are projects in our lives that the Spirit of God wants to bring about change. And maybe we've tried, we've tried to change. But we're trying to do it on our own power. We would do well this morning with the Apostle Paul to fall on our knees in humility. To pray to God the Father who, in whom eh, He's got the authority over every name in heaven and on earth. And we pray for power for Christ to dwell in our hearts through faith. First thing he prays is that we would have immeasurably more of Christ's presence in our lives. That takes the power of God. Resurrection power. Second thing he prays for is that we would have power to experience immeasurably more of Christ's love. Look with me at verse 17 as it continues. He says, and I pray for you that you being rooted and established in love, verse 18, may have power. He prays for power again. Power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. He first prayed that we would have immeasurably, immeasurably more of Christ's presence, dwelling, taking up residence in our lives. But secondly, he turns his attention to the love of God. The love of God that's expressed to us in Jesus Christ, who at the cross took our sin, our punishment, our, uh, the, the, the death that we deserved, and he gave us his life, his righteousness, and we say, uh, amazing love, how can it be that God, my Savior, would die for me? I want you to think about the first time, or uh, not the first time, any time that you experienced that, that you just, that the love of God really sank in in your life. Think, think, think about that moment with me. Maybe, maybe it was a, a service, or maybe you were reading a scripture, maybe, maybe you were just uh, talking with someone about uh, the gospel, and, and the love of God just sunk in. Paul prays that we would have power to grasp that God's love is so much greater than that experience that you've already experienced. Your experience of Christ's love pales in comparison to the height and the depth and the width and the length of God's love. Uh, uh, Paul, uh, imagine Paul praying to the Father that we would have power to grasp the love of God. And he, he says, how do I measure how much they want, how much this love is for us? And, and, and he, goes, he goes dimensional. He goes, he goes long, wide, deep, high. And, and and he prays that we would have power to grasp that, that the love of God goes beyond any dimension of our experience. It, that the love of God goes farther, it goes deeper, it goes wider than we have experienced now in our lives. And so take that experience of God's love in your life, that where, you, where you grasp that love, and, and, and times it times affinity, and Paul says, I pray for power that you would grasp this love. You see, the love of God, it's greater than we, we can even imagine. You've, you've probably seen these glasses before. When you came in, you, uh, I, I snuck them in your bulletins. They're uh, 3D glasses. Now, you put them on right now, and you just look funny. But it, has anyone ever seen one of these 3D movies? 
where, where you go to the movies and you, and you, you put on these glasses, and, and the movie goes from being like two, two dimensional, so it starts coming out of the screen. I remember the first time I, I, I saw one of these, my family went to uh, Walt Disney World and they had one of these uh, experience. I think they, they call it 4D. And you, you go in and you wear these glasses. And, and when you put on the glasses, it, the, the, it looks like the things are coming out of the screen towards you. It, you, you, you get this new dimension uh, 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 of the whole experience. And then, and then you, if you're ever sitting in one of these movies, you take off your glasses and it's just, it looks funny. It's just, it's just normal. It's just, just a screen, but you put them back on and it starts coming out at you again. Paul prays for power that we would have a new kind of lens for God's love. That we would have three-dimensional, four-dimensional, a multi-dimensional vision of God's love for you. And so so what your current or present experience of God's love for you is, he says it goes longer, it goes wider, it goes deeper, it goes higher. God's love is greater than we can ever imagine. He prays for immeasurably more love in your life. So I'm here to say this morning that you are loved immeasurably more than you know. You are loved by God more than your mind can comprehend. And it takes the power of God at work in our lives. It takes us falling on our knees before the Father saying, I I don't even get this love, but I need your power to come and empower me to give me new goggles, new vision, a new way of seeing your love. What if we prayed like that? What if we prayed for the power of God to show us more of his love? In the church, sometimes we, we're, we're afraid of experience. We like truth. We like absolutes. And there's been, there's been branches of the church that have, that have maximized experience and minimized truth, and that's been a disaster. But we can't minimize experience here. Because Paul prays for the power of God to give us an experience of God's love. It's not just something we mentally grasp. It's something that sinks deep into our hearts where we basically fall into an ocean of God's love that is higher and wider and deeper than we could ever imagine. And and, and the power of God enables us to do that. So I pray for power that you would experience immeasurably more of Christ's love. Those words we sang just moments ago. Could we with ink the ocean fill? In the skies were a parchment made. In every stalk on earth, every tree, uh, every piece of grass, it, it, it's a pen, it's a quill. And, 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 and we try to write the love of God across the parchment of the skies. It would drain the ocean dry. And the sky wouldn't even be able to contain it. The love of God, so rich and pure, so measureless and strong. You are loved more than you know. And I pray for power that we would grasp that. And that's what he, that's what he says, it, to know this love, verse 19, that surpasses knowledge. I mean, that's a paradox. He prays that you would know something that knowledge can't know. That's the love of God. Notice that phrase that he finishes 
with there in verse 19, that you may be filled to the measure with all the fullness of God. This is the aim of the prayer. This is the end of the power of God. This is what God wants to do in your life. He wants more of God and less of you. You see, God wants to do immeasurably more in your life. God wants to come in by His Spirit, and Jesus wants to take up residence. He wants to put His touches on your life, and it takes the power of God, and it takes the power of God diving deep into the love of God so that God may dwell in us fully. God wants this for your life, and power is is pretty important. In fact, it's essential to the Christian life. And so as a church, I pray that we would be people that pray for power. What do you pray for? We pray for the concerns, the things on our mind. I encourage you this week, take these goofy glasses and put them somewhere in the house. Put them on your car dashboard. Put them on the bathroom sink. Put them somewhere where each day this week where you see these glasses, would you take a moment and would you pray for power? Power to experience immeasurably more of Jesus' presence and immeasurably more of Jesus' love. Let's put these somewhere and pray this prayer with Paul. That we would grasp experientially and fully how much Jesus loves you and how much more Jesus wants to do in your life. And it takes the power of God. We, we try to have one of these batteries charged at all times. So that when we get that dreaded message, change the battery, we have one charged. In the Christian life, power comes through prayer. Power comes through setting aside routine and regular time with Jesus in prayer. And you would think we would get that. But life gets busy. You would think that Mary and I, after 803 days of making daily videos, we remember to charge our battery, but life gets busy. But power is important. In fact, it's essential. And this is why Paul closes this first section of Ephesians with a prayer for power is that we would get that Christ has done so much for us and in us. He's raised us from the dead. He's seated us with him. He's chosen us in love. We are rooted and established in Christ. We are grounded in his life and his resurrection power. And he says, I don't want you to just be positionally get this. I want you to live in it. I want you to walk in it. And that's where Ephesians is going to go from here. He's going to get real practical what this looks like in the church and in your life. But for now, he prays that we would be grounded in the power source. That we would be, make a regular practice of plugging in our batteries and spending time before the Father praying, I want immeasurably more of your presence in my life and I want immeasurably more of your love to envelop me. Would you make a regular practice of that? Set aside time to pray for power. And I guarantee that God will do immeasurably more than you ask for. In fact, that's what Paul says, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, According to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.